seems almost too simple. Could plants alone really have the power to shape the course of human history? Or was there something else at play? Another reason for the division of the world into haves and have-nots. By 9,000 years ago, the first settlements in the Middle East were giving way to much larger villages. People were only able to live on this scale by becoming more productive farmers. They were surrounded by fields of domesticated wheat and barley. But by now, they also had another steady source of food. What we see happening about 9,000 years ago is a remarkable transformation in the way that humans are interacting with animals. We begin to see a process of animal domestication, by which we mean humans were controlling where they were moving, they were controlling their feeding, and they were controlling their breeding. Instead of having to go out to hunt, you have a dependable meat supply on the hoof uh, year round around your site, rather than being subject to seasonal variations in wild game. As well as meat, animals could be used for their milk, providing an ongoing source of protein. Their hair and skins could be used to make clothes for extra warmth. Over time, domestic animals became an integral part of the new agricultural way of life. We know that uh, the communities which first started to have domestic animals already had cereal crops, so they were cultivators. And the combination of these particular animals and the plants becomes an extremely attractive package in that they're complementary. After the harvest period, animals could be turned out on the stubble and they can actually eat the remains of the cereal crop harvest. In their turn, animal dung can be used to provide a sort of a fertilizer for the cereal crops as well, for crops. So the whole, the whole package, you know, is seen to be mutually beneficial, both for the animals and the plants, and of course, for the humans. Goats and sheep were the first animals to be domesticated in the ancient world and were eventually followed by the other big farm animals of today. All of them were used at first for their meat, but they all proved useful in other ways, especially with the invention of the plow. Before the Industrial Revolution, beasts of burden were the most powerful machines on the planet. A horse or an ox harnessed to a plow could transform the productivity of the land, allowing farmers to grow more food and feed more people. In New Guinea and many other parts of the world, people never used plows because they never had the animals to pull them. The only big domestic animal in New Guinea was the pig, and it wasn't even native. It came in from Asia a few thousand years ago. While Europe and Asia had not only pigs, but also cows, sheep, goats, horses, buffalo, camels, and so on. Now, pigs do give you meat, but pigs don't give you the other products that you get from those European nation animals. Pigs don't give you milk or wool or leather or hides. And most important of all, pigs can't be used for muscle power. Pigs don't pull plows or pull carts. The only muscle power in New Guinea was human muscle power. Even today, there are no beasts of burden in New Guinea, and almost all of the farm work is still done by hand. But if farm animals were so useful, why didn't New Guineans domesticate any of their own? 
I decided to add up all the animals in the world that have ever been domesticated. And I was amazed by what I found. There are nearly two million known species of wild animals, but the vast majority have never been farmed. Most insects and rodents are of no practical use to humans and not worth the effort of farming. Some birds, fish, and reptiles have been domesticated, but most are simply impractical to farm. So are most carnivores, not because they're dangerous, but because you'd have to grow other animals just to feed them. The best animals to farm are large, plant-eating mammals. And over the years, humans have probably tried to domesticate all of them, usually without success. Despite repeated efforts, Africans have never domesticated the elephant. In South Asia, some elephants are used as work animals, but they're not farmed for the purpose. Instead, each elephant is caught in the wild and then tamed and trained. It doesn't make economic sense to farm an animal that takes some 15 years to mature and reach an age where it can start reproducing. Animals which make suitable candidates for domestication can start giving birth in their first or second years. They will have one or maybe two offspring a year, so their productivity is actually high. Behaviorally, they need to be social animals, meaning that the males and the females and the young all live together as a group, and they also have an internal social hierarchy which means that if humans can control the leader, then they will also gain control over a whole herd, a whole flock. There is another crucial requirement for a domestic animal. It needs to get along with humans. Some animals don't have the temperament to live on a farm. A zebra could be an ideal domestic animal, potentially as useful as a horse. But evolving in the midst of Africa's great predators, zebras have become flighty, nervous creatures. They have a vicious streak that humans have been unable to tame. That may be why zebras have never been harnessed to a plow or ridden into battle. I counted up 148 different species of wild, plant-eating, terrestrial mammals that weigh over 100 pounds. But of those 148, the number that have ever been successfully farmed for any length of time is just 14. Goats, sheep, pigs, cows, horses, donkeys, Bactrian camels, Arabian camels, water buffalo, llamas, reindeer, yaks, mythans, and bally cattle. Just 14 large domestic animals in 10,000 years of domestication. And where did the ancestors of these animals come from? None was from New Guinea, or Australia, or Sub-Saharan Africa or the whole continent of North America. South America had the ancestor of just one large domestic animal, the llama. The other 13 were all from Asia, North Africa, and Europe. And of these, the big four livestock animals, cows, pigs, sheep, and goats, were native to the Middle East. The very same area that was home to some of the best crops in the world was also home to some of the best animals. Little wonder that this area became known as the Fertile Crescent. 